Well, good evening to everyone across the Asia Pacific region and beyond. I am Jamal Ashraf, the second vice president of the APOA, filling in for my dear friend Marini, who's unable to join due to some family commitments. On behalf of the Asia Pacific Trauma Society, it is my proud privilege to welcome you to this monthly educational initiative of the society. The topic for today's proceedings is revision surgery in trauma care. And so without much ado, I would like to take this opportunity I am to join a galaxy of speakers that we have today for this webinar, in front of whom, frankly speaking, I feel a little dwarfed. I would start by introducing Dr. Epipop. He's the chief of trauma unit, Department of Orthopedics, at the Faculty of Medicine, Prince Songkla University, Thailand. His area of expertise is lower limb trauma and pelvic surgery. He's a regular AO Trauma Regional and International Faculty and also chairs the Education Committee of the AO Trauma Thailand, Dr. Epipa. Then we have Dr. Maria Adelvisa Bilen, who is the Section Head for Trauma at St. Luke's Medical Center, Institute of Orthopedics and Sports Medicine in Manila, Philippines. She is the Community Development Officer of AO Trauma Philippines. And what I find personally most impressive is that she's a volunteer for the Medicine Sans Frontiers or the Doctors Without Borders. Adele, welcome. Thank you. Then Dr. Sushrut Babulkar. Dr. Sushrut is the Chief of Trauma and Arthroplasty Department of Orthopedics at the Sushrut Institute of Medical Sciences in Nagpur, India. He's the current president of the Trauma Society of India. He's a regular AO Trauma Regional and International Faculty and also the past chair of the Education Committee of AO Trauma India. Welcome, Sushrut. Then I come on to Dr. Hakan Kinnik, who's the immediate past president of the Asia Pacific Trauma Society. He's the Trauma Section Chief of Ankara University, Ibn Sina Hospital of Orthopedics and Traumatology in the beautiful city of Ankara, Turkey. He's also the Trauma Section Editor of the Acta Orthopedica A Traumatologica. Then we have Jane from outside the Asia Pacific region. Jane's been very kind to join us from the UK in the early hours of a Sunday. Jane is a trauma consultant at the University Hospital of Coventry and Warwickshire. Her main interests are in open managing open fractures. She enjoys being a chair of the current concepts of AO Trauma UK and is also the current education chair of UK Orthopedic Trauma Society. Actually, Jane, you are the guest that we have on this webinar because the rest are APO members. And finally, Dr. Khairul Muhammad, who is a consultant orthopedic foot and ankle surgeon working at the Pental Group of Hospitals in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. He's also the chair of AO Trauma Malaysia. And finally, Dr. Anup Agarwal, who is a consultant trauma surgeon at the Sushil Hospital and Trauma Center in Lucknow, India. He's the president-elect of the Asia Pacific Trauma Society and quite instrumental in these educational online uh, initiatives that have been going on during the COVID time. So over to Hakan to start off the proceedings. Uh, thank you, Jamal, for the introduction. Uh, we will go directly uh, to the first presentation by Dr. Apipop about uh, region surgery in subtrochanteric fractures. Please, Dr. Apipop. Thank you so much for your introduction. So, let me share my slide now. Can you see my slide? So, hello everyone across the Asia Pacific regions. So, uh, it's my great pleasure to be here. And first of all, I would like to thank Asia, Thomas, Asia Pacific Thomas Society for this invitation. So, in this talk, I'm going to cover, uh, I will talk about the revision surgery in subtrochanteric fractures. So, all of you know that the revision surgery in subtrochanteric fractures most of, mostly come from the subtrochanteric non unit and depend failure. So, in this talk, I'm going to cover about the why this communication happens, what are the lead factors and treatment principles of these communications. And lastly, I'm go I will show you some case examples. So comparing with the, the other proximal femoral fractures, the subtrochanteric non-union in plant failure, the incidence of this is higher than the others. And this has been reported from 
4 to 20 percent. So why this complica complication happens? And it comes from many reasons. Firstly, the high def uh, deforming forces from the muscle pooling around this area can increase the risk of malreductions. And secondly, uh, it comes from the bo bo poor bone healing in this area because this subcategoric region is a cortical bone which has poor water supply. And then the other reason is there's sometimes there's some form of the poor surgical techniques of the surgeon. For example, in this case, this subtrope practice, the surgeon decides to do the open nailing by opening the fracture site and do multiple circuit violins around the fracture zones. That's mean all of the soft tissue surrounding these fractures is disrupted and also dissections of the vascular supply around the bone. So finally, the fracture went to non-union at nine months after surgery. So another reason for the poor bone healing in this area is bit phosphonate induced atypical fracture that I think all of you know about this. So there are three list fractures uh, that related to subtrophic non-unions after nailing. The post normative virus malreactions, the lack of media cortical support, and also the auto dynamization of nail within three months after surgeries. All of these are the these factors. And more importantly, you have to know that the more number of the lead factors, the more increasing of non unit lead. So, as a surgeon, we have to observe and recognize of these three list factors in order to prevent this complication occur before the implant failure. So why this, uh, in, this subtrope non is so difficult? Because both of the cases we have implant in place that we need to remove it before we do the revision surgeries. And after we remove the implant, there are some cases that we have a lot of bone loss and many cases that we have uh, severe deformity and malalignment. And the, the worst scenario, Sometimes we have the infected non-union with dead bone. So what are the, the, the treatment of this subtrophic non-union? Recently, we don't have a even one level study for this. All of the study is just only level four retrospective review and case series. But the treatment visible for this subtrophic non-union is the same as the other union for the fractures, uh, which including the revision surgery that we have to remove the previous implant and refixation the fractures on union with the nailing or plating. And for the hip aplaplasty, sometimes we reserve for the elderly patients. And in the case with atropic or oligotropic non-union, uh, we, we recommended to do bone clotting in order to increase the bone biology for the fracture healing. And furthermore, the best treatment of the subtrope on union is avoidance and prevention of this condition occur. So let's take a look in the case. The first case is young male, a young patient, 63 years old, got a motorcycle accident, and he had a subtrope fracture on the right femur. And the surgeon from the other hospital performed the close nailing, and you can see from this X-ray. But we'll. When we look closer at the X-ray, we found that one of the distal locking screw is in the fracture zone. So at one month, only one month after surgeries, this patient heard the cracking sounds. And after that, suddenly he wasn't able to bear any weight on his right leg. So for the X-ray, we found the, the broken nail and also the fracture is not healed. So when we take a look at this, uh, uh, when we, when we invest, investigate uh, the infection for this patient, there's no sign of infections from the blood test and also the physical examination. So what, what to do now? So because the problem in this case is the unstable fixation for the subtrope fracture because the short nail is not suitable for this fracture, right? So in this case, we just remove the short nailing by using the cross technique without any open opening at the fracture zone. And then we just uh, insert the long nail and the larger nail 
and perform the percutaneous boiling in order to promote, uh, preserve the uh, vascularity around the fracture site. And finally, this, this patient has a, this patient got a good healing of the fractures and one year after surgeries. So the leading point of this case is for the subtalk fractures, I think we need to use the really strong and stable fixation. This is really important to achieve healing in these fractures. Please avoid to use short nailing for these fractures. So let's move to the second case. This is the young female patient sustained a road traffic accident. And this patient has uh, intertonic fractures on the right femur with subtrochondric extensions. And you can see here from the x-ray. In this case, because of the, the high, uh, high energy fractures, so we have to do mini open deduction of the fracture size. And after that, we stabilize the whole fracture with the long nailing. However, when we take a look at the post-operative X-ray, we found that small gap at the subtrochal area. So at three months after surgery, the intertrochal fractures seem to be uh, have a good healing, right? But still have uh, there's no much healing at the subtrochal extension. So at five months after surgery, the patient come to visit me at the clinic, and he said is still pain on walking. And after we investigate her with the blood test and also physical examination, there's no side infections. So for this case, when we take a look and uh, check, take, took her for the CT scan, we found that the, there's a non-union at the anteroatral aspect of the subtrochal area. And, we, we, and, then, and then after we clearly interpret the, the whole alignment of the factor, there's no wireless malalignment in this case. And also she's had a good medial cortical support at the proximal femur. And there's no broken distal locking screw. So what to do now in this case? Because this, this patient has a good alignment. So just we, we just need, she just need another adding of the stable, stable fixation. So we do the uh, lateral plate augmentation and also uh, enhance the bone healing with the, with the iliac autograph. So in this case, at six months after revision surgeries, the, 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 the fracture went to heal really nicely without any complication. So for the learning point of this case, so even the small gap in subtermetic fracture can increase the risk of non-union. And the plate augmentation is very useful to in increase the stability of nail fixation in well aligned on union. So this is another option that we can treat the subtermetic non-union. So another case, uh, the old patients uh, has a road traffic accident and the surgeon performed the close nailing. But at 10 months after surgeries, uh, he still had severe pain and limitation of peak fractions and also a lot of trouble during walking. So when you take a look at this X-ray, AP X-ray, we found that the malreduction of the proximal fragment in external rotation and also the severe friction deformity from the lateral X-ray. And when we uh, took, took this patient for the long-standing film, we found this uh, around two centimeter shortening on the right femur as well. So what to do in this case? So because this kid has a non-union with severe uh, deformity and more alignment after nailing, so we decided to, uh, to uh, do the open reduction after removal of the short nail. And as you see from the interoperative uh, pictures, you see that a big cortical hole and the posterior lateral aspect of the nail that formed the previous nail. So after that, we do the open reduction. We collect the length with the field of this sector and also try to reduce the fracture with point deducted, pointed deduction cramp and stabilize the whole fracture. And, and then we do the in the fragmentary, fragmentary compression across the non-union and stabilize the whole fracture with the double plate fixations. And also we enhance the bone biology with uh, 
Consulate AutoCAF, 90, 90cc of the AutoCAF, and also BMP. So this fracture also went to heal very nicely at six months after revision surgery. So the point of learning in this case, we need to collect deformity in subtunic non-union with bow alignment after nailing by using the plastic. First, we do open deductions and need really strong impact like a fixed angle plating, like uh, such as 90 degree angle blade plate or LCP. And more importantly, every time when you do revision surgery with plating, we need to do interfragment compression across the non-union. This is the key to success for achieving the union in the non-union problem. So let's take a look in the last case. This young uh, female got a car accident and she has a cer cervical tracheal fracture with subtunic extensions on the left on the left femur. And this patient had really small internal canal, just only seven five five millimeters. So it is impossible to do nailing in this case. So in this case, the surgeon decided to do MIPO and using the reverse uh, distal femur FCP to fix the whole fractures. So when you take a look at the post operative X-ray, at two days and six weeks, it seemed to be all right and pretty good. However, at, at three months after surgery, the fracture went to wireless deformities and you can see some uh, bone defect at the uh, funeral head. And at six months after surgery, this patient got a severe wireless alignment and also a bigger of the bone defect at the funeral head and one school loosening. So what, what can we do for this old lady? So because this case has a big bone defect at the funeral head, and you need that, it means that the, the, there's very really narrow uh, space for the fix, uh, for the good pressure from the internal fixation in this funeral head. So we decide to do the hip, total hip replacements uh, in this case and just leave the uh, plate fixation inside in order to prevent the stabilizer from the locking screw hole. So what is the point? What are the point of learning in this case? Uh, the hip arthroplasty for failed subtunic fixation, uh, fixation is reserved for the elderly patient with articular damage from the cutout screw or massive bone defect at the proximal fragment from the previous fixations. So for summary in this, in my talk, the revision surgery in subtunic factor from non-union or pain failure is very challenging procedures. As a surgeon, we have to analyze, understand, and understand the cause of non-union failure in terms of biomechanic problem, also biological problem, and then treat it as the cause. And the pre-operative planning to collect the cause of this commission is very crucial. And lastly, I would like to emphasize you again, best treatment for subtunic non-union is avoidance and prevent of this commission to be occur because it's very really difficult to treat this kind of complication. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Apipop. Uh, very nice presentation. We have five minutes left uh, and we have some questions. If you, you will give uh, quick answers, maybe we can uh, answer all the questions. The first question is, uh, is it safe to apply uh, circulage wires with intramedullary nails in the uh, treatment of subtrochanteric fractures? It's, it's, it's quite safe, uh, but you have to, to, to do in the code technique. That means that first you have to do just not open like a big hole, just open just the two centimeters or three centimeters. And then the important is that you have to, uh, you will insert the, uh, the, the wire passer. You have to touch the bone along, along the bone in order to prevent the, the, the vascular injury on the middle side of the proximal femur. So there's many papers that, that, that prove that is safe if you if do, do it in the correct, correct ways. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And there are two questions about combination of plate and uh, nail usage. One question is, uh, why do you use in your case a smaller plate, plate instead of uh, a more uh, larger plate? And 
Uh, another question is, do you, uh, at the initial subtrochanteric fracture surgery, do you combine plate and nail fixation? Not in the revision cases, but in the initial cases. So for the second question, I think usually we, we, we can choose either nail or plate. But at the initial, you have to choose only one implant. But the key is you have to do it in by to preserve the biology like uh, cross nailing or, or mini open nailing or uh, plating. But the, the, the other key is if you uh, select the plate, you need to, to choose the fixed angle plating. Don't try to use just non-fixation plating like uh, the, the worst DF or echo plate plate. So for this, uh, I think for, for the initially, you have to choose one implant and mm -hmm. do it in the, in the good way. That means uh, try to do, to do it close. Or if you, it possible, it's not possible to do close reduction, you have to open, just mini open reductions. I think uh, uh, between the plate and nailing is it's the same, but you have to do it in the in the uh, in the good and also the good handling of the soft issue. Mm -hmm. So can can you can you can you ask me again about the first question? Uh, in your uh, case, you put an uh, augmentation plate, a yep. smaller okay. augmentation plate. Do you prefer yeah. larger plates? Uh, for the plate augmentation, I think uh, in this case because the you have the nail inside. Uh, and uh, it's, it's almost always off the, 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 yeah, the narrow space to fit the plate. So uh, if you would like to do a big plate, plating, it's, it's sometimes it's very difficult to put the plate in. I mean, the other school will off duck with the nail. So it's better to use smaller plate, but longer. Small and longer plate as the plate augmentation. Yeah. Okay, and the last question uh, is, uh, when you are revising an IM nail, sometimes the leg screw to the head is positioned wrongly, and sometimes it is in the correct position. So yeah. what is your strategy if it is in the correct position or it is in the wrong position? So you have two ways. The first one is uh, you change to the place fixation system. It's easier because if you put the plate nail in, it's almost always in the same track, right? So you change to the place fix fixation system. And the, the second way is you have to uh, do like a polar screw because most of the time when you have the failure of the nail fixation, the nail is always a two lateral position at the proximal fragment. So just put one or two polar screw to block the, the nail that nail but, come to uh, yeah. Sorry, I I mean not the nail, but the leg screw to the head. Uh, I can't. Yep. You can't change its position by putting a leg uh, blocking screw. I think. You mean the nailing, right? Not the nail, but the uh, leg screw going to the head is uh, in the wrong position or it is in the best position. If it is in the best position, you exchange the nail with uh, the uh, previous uh, leg screw pad or you change the brand to uh, make another uh, hole that cross and uh, decreases our fixation. What is your strategy? Uh, if you would like to do nailing, right? To revision, right? For revision. Uh, you take out the nail yeah. and you have yeah. a hole in the head Yes, and yes, sir. How would you uh, revise it if you want uh, the revision with the nail? How would you put the leg screw to the head? Ah, uh, okay. So, firstly, you have to change the entry point because when you have a subtroke non union, it's, most of the time we have the two lateral entry point. So, you need it more medial, right? So, if you, you that, that means you have to do the blocking screw or polar screw. To, to change the anti point. And then after you change the anti point, your leg screw will go to another place, not the same way anymore. So another trick that you have to, to, to collect the anti point, that more, more challenging procedures. There's some paper from Professor O that he used the polar screw in order to change the nail position. And then you, you can cut 
you can get a very good position of the leg school from the nail as well. I'm okay. just sharing the eighty point. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I want to move to the other. Moment. Thank you so much. Uh, my dear friend, Dr. Anna, for the second uh, moderation. Dr. Anu, you are. Yes. So, may I now invite Adil to talk about revision surgery in femoral shaft fractures? Okay. Uh, my slides okay? Yeah, all okay. okay. Good. Thank you. Hello. Um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are around Asia Pacific. Thank you very much to APOA and APOA Trauma Society for the kind invitation and the opportunity to share our work as well as learn from our other colleagues. Um, my talk is about um, revision surgery for femoral shaft fractures. Um, okay, now it's moving. I'm sorry for that. I have nothing to disclose, no conflict of interest, and would like to acknowledge the following colleagues for their contribution to the uh, cases. Our learning objective basically is to discuss the decision points in revision femoral shaft fractures, touching on the basic principles, the etiology, and the fixation options and techniques. So. I still remember the feeling of finishing my trauma course and uh, doing my first surgery. I feel like I'm Wonder Woman. I can do anything. So a day in the life of a trauma surgeon, you get all these fractures. You can probably classify in your sleep. You, all, you have the books and all the toys available. And then... Some months later, you get cold and you get faced like uh, a case like this one. So what do you do? It's easy to put the blame on something or the other. It's a non-union. It's this fault and that fault. But is it really just one or the other? So my goal is to be able to uh, check what or how can you arrive at the conclusion so that the complication gets to be addressed properly. The truth of the matter is no one wants a complication. I can speak for a lot of surgeons, most of us. However, complications, whether it's an infection, a deformity, a large bone defect, soft tissue injuries are all challenging to treat. Treat. Understanding your options is key to choosing the appropriate management protocol. Complications happen because of failure to understand the principles, failure to apply the correct principles, or even failure to recognize a problem. The, the, base, the most basic of our principles in fracture union is we teach this to our colleagues about achieving a balance between biology and biomechanics. So we need to look back at all the other variables or all the other factors that affect bone healing so that we can understand why the complication happened. It can be the injury factors, the location, the severity of the soft tissue, the severity of the bone injury. It can be the patient or the host. A lot of comorbidities, especially for the elderly, or it can be us, surgical factors. Is it a failure of planning? Is it iatrogenic trauma? Is it an unstable fixation or just the correct principle but the poor execution of such? Is there an infection is the, one of the primary questions that needs to be answered prior to planning your Surgery. Is it a patient factor? Is it the fracture pattern? Or is it the technique that caused uh, all these things? 
are, did we ask too much from the implant that we were using? So we start with the case, a 78-year-old female, low energy fall. So pretty straightforward. The patient underwent intramedullary nailing. Uh, I didn't get a hold of the final x-ray post-op, but I was asked to look at this two months after. So a lot of other, a lot of different factors. So the, the patient was already complaining of pain around uh, the knee area, probably because of the backing out of the screws. And she was having difficulty uh, in walking. So among other things, obviously, uh, there is a problem in the, in the reduction. Uh, in the so in the initial reduction so the co most common question is is it a problem of biology is it a problem of stability or is it a combination of both is there an in existing infection because that will dictate how you will uh, go about the planning if you're going to do a single stage or a two stage um, surgery and other issues so this patient the infection parameters were uh, normal. However, as soon as we got the two screws out, there was uh, abscess coming out of that screw hole. So it pretty much sealed the deal for, for uh, the decision to make it a two-stage two procedure. And we proceeded with removal of the nail. Uh, ideally, put in... Uh, after intramedullary reaming, you can put in uh, an antibiotic nail, but it's not available to us. So what we have uh, prepared usually is either a rush nail or a concher nail. The concher nail usually a size 7, but it's not readily available also. That's why we ask for a rush nail. And then we get a CTT uh, tubing, mix the bone cement, and then fashion an antibiotic nail by using this as a mold, and then the rest can be used as beads. So this is um, how we did it. It's a rush rod, um, maintained it for uh, six weeks while the patient was undergoing antibiotic uh, completion antibiotic treatment appropriate for the organism and then after six weeks uh, the definitive uh, surgery so the the, the planning the, the discussion points will be what type of implant are we going to use what type of reduction technique will there be a significant bone defect and what other um, biologic enhancers will uh, we use or are available. So uh, there, there was not much uh, significant bone defect. Um, this is what we did. Uh, we placed a plate, we put the um, combined iliac bone graft with uh, BMP, and then uh, we plated. And then um, afterwards, uh, the patient went on to healing. So this was three years no complaint of pain and um, patient was able to uh, ambulate um, comfortably. The next case, 58-year-old male, uh, fell around seven steps while going down the stairs. There was um, three centimeter shortening upon presentation. Pretty straightforward, the patient, but the patient had to be flown in from one of the islands. So there was a, somewhat a little in, in the initial surgery. So this is what was shown to me after the surgery. Uh, we were in discussion with uh, the colleagues and um, pretty much tried to get to the bottom of the problem one by one. So the con this is what we saw. The entry point was too well, the, the alignment was unacceptable because it was not reduced. There was medial collapse. 
and the recon screws were outside of the neck. So everything that you don't want to happen happened here. So this is a summary of the problem and we asked that the patient be scheduled for a revision surgery because there was uh, uh, the fixation was unstable. So what happened was um, we removed the nail, um, changed to a new entry point, uh, tried to reduce it, and then uh, this is uh, what we had. Although it, the patient went on to healing by just a little bit of delay in the weight bearing. However, in retrospect, the, the, we discussed that it would have been a lot uh, improved had we used an augmentation plate, just like the previous uh, lecture. Another case, so the patient came in presenting with this already because the initial surgery was done elsewhere. A 24-year-old male was involved in a motorcycle accident, had an IM nail done. Three months after, there was... Uh, uh, sinus there was drainage of uh from the from a wound and then um there was an initial debridement done however the plate the nail was not removed and then so one year after the initial surgery patient came to our institution the, i didn't uh this is not my case but um we have a who does um, distraction osteogenesis a lot, and these are cases that are uh, good for for revision. So there was an after the final removal of the implant, together with the uh, removal of the infection and everything. So there was an eight centimeter gap, and then the the distraction osteogenesis. Uh, was done, uh, total fixator time of nine months, and then the patient went on to heal uh, with no significant uh, shortening and no pain. The last case, a 58-year-old male uh, got into an accident, uh, was hit by a car. So the, the initial, uh, he came initially with this, there was a fracture seven months prior, but uh, he underwent debridement for the open fracture, but never got to uh, have any fixation because of financial issues. So patient came in seven months after with a draining sinus and a deformity like this. So patient underwent debridement and um, application of the uh, frame. And this is... Um, what we see, so came in with shortening, virus, and internal rotation, 8, C, uh, eight centimeter gap. So initial correction and day 21, so progressing day 28. And then at day 42, day 72, so it was already um, equal and the deformity is corrected and the patient uh, is that the fracture is already healed so patient is quite happy so going back even addressing the uh, revision surgeries you still go back to our basic principle it has to be a balance between biology and biomechanics so we need to improve biomechanics we need to improve biology by using iliac bone graft, um, other biologics, or even uh, vascularized bone grafts as needed. It can be a combination of both. So both factors need to be addressed. My take-home message for this is um, non-unions, infections are the most common causes of revision surgery for uh, femur, fract femur shaft fractures, the 
etiology is mostly multifactorial and as well as the treatment. So there's a need to understand the causes to be able to address the problem. We need to improve biology. We need to improve biomechanics. We cannot overemphasize that. Modify the technique as applicable. Use assistive technology when available. And if you are not the best person to do it, ask for help. It, it, it's never wrong to ask for help, especially for the large bone defects. Predicting the outcome of reconstruction of large bone defects remain predictable. However, the patient should always be informed that although these potential complications are predictable, some cases of reconstruction process may be long and difficult. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adil, for your wonderful talk. Uh, we have few of the question. Uh, the question number one is both for people and Adil. Should mm -hmm. not have dynamization tried in both of your cases? In your shaft femur cases and subtract fractures also, Epipa? Am I audible? Uh, I have to answer, right? Yeah. So for, for, for the subtract fractures, don't try to do dynamization because it can create more unstable. So I personally don't do it. You have to do it in other ways, like uh, revision uh, fix surgery with the nailing or plating or the plate augmentation. It depends on the, your situations. Thank you. Thank you. And Adel, in your cases of fracture shaft femur, do you do a dynamization if you're finding, it, let's say, four, six weeks, if you're finding it is going into non-union and it's a stable fracture, so do you go for dynamization? Um, like in one yes, of it, your initial cases. Yeah, it's, it's always an option, um, but the, the, the parameter should be that the reduction, the initial reduction is good already, that the length, axis, and rotation are there so that you just need that small um, movement uh, to be able to uh, to achieve compression on, however, one of the cases, then the screws dynamize themselves already, so that is not an option for me. So, but yes, dynamization is always part of the initial um, initial uh, management options. Thank you. So the next question is femoral shaft non-union with 5 mm gap. Should we do just bone grafting or should we do exchange nailing with reaming of the shaft? What's your take on this? 5 centimeter, five centimeter bone gap. 5 centimeter? Uh, mm, five mm. mm. Millimeter. Less than a centimeter. Half 5 centimeters cent between friends. No, but... Uh, <laughs> Yes, uh, dynamic that rim, uh, reaming. If the nail, it, it, it's not easy as one, two, three. You need to be able to see the x ray itself, you need to be able to analyze is it the correct size as well? Is it the correct length? Um, is it the correct rotation? If um, five millimeters, then yes, it's an it's an option. But um, what I usually um, discuss with the younger colleagues is it's not as easy as okay, five millimeter the chart. You can do this. You can do this. It's always analyzing what where the problem happened. It's going back to the basic principle: is it biology? Is it biomechanics? Right. So basically, you'll have to look at the fracture geometry, the type of fixation, the biology, and then decide. It's not just the 5 mm which you can catch up and do just one procedure in every case. Yeah. Thank you. So there was uh, this question is in reference to your second case where uh, there was a nailing done in a uh, wrongly reduced fracture. Why was cemented rush nail put in the original wrong track? and not put into the correct lumen in the proximal fragment, where you had put in a rush nail with the cemented uh, coating. Because um, that was the dilemma in intra-op. Um, do we put it in the, in the original track, or do we put in, in, in a track that is 
um, in the intramedullary correct intramedullary canal. So we 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 decided to place it in the original tract because that's where the infection was, and just proceed with the. Um, at that point, it wasn't still clear whether we're going to do a final nail or a final plate around that time. We needed to address the, the infection and then uh, address whatever challenges uh, that we are faced once the infection has been um, controlled. So that um, we didn't want to make a new track and introduce infection in that track as well. So the, the the antibiotic rod was for the infection along the, the original track. Right, right. Thank you. Uh, this is in reference to a comment or a suggestion from one of the uh, participants in reference to your last case, a ring fixative for femoral non-union is very cumbersome and painful. So, do you prefer a rail fixator in such cases or do you still prefer the rail fixators for such cases? Um, for, me, sometimes, for me, sometimes the decision is will, will always, the more important question is um, what will give um, what uh, method will give us the most um, benefit for the patient? So that, yes, it's always, um, there's no perfect answer to what is better the one over the other because uh, it's always what will benefit be most beneficial for the patient. And it's a matter of explaining to the patient as well that, Yes, this might be cumbersome, but with the with the challenges that we are facing, with the your deformity and your the issues in the in the fracture or in the femur, then this might be the best uh, option for you. So it's always also uh, aside from that decision is discussing the options with the patient as well. Uh, right. And I think it depends upon your own expertise in a particular technique also, which you might prefer. Yes. So, so thank if you. I, if I recognize, so I'll I hand know. over to Hakan. For the okay. 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 Thank you, Adar. Uh, the next speech will be given by Dr. Sushrut uh, Babulkar about distal femoral uh, fracture revision surgery. Please, Dr. Babulkar. Uh, thank you very much. It's a, a real honor to be here. Uh, thanks, Jamal. Thanks, Hakan. And thanks, Anup, to involve me. And of course, Marines, whom we are missing today. Um, I'm going to not lecture, but share my thoughts uh, on some revision and some difficult distal femur cases that I have encountered over the period of time. And let us see how uh, I have managed to uh, kind of swim through uh, this. So I'm going to take you through some unusual cases, of course, some very usual encounters that we as trauma orthopedic surgeons face. So this is a very common scenario that you and me see. So this was a young guy, femur was a grade two, segmental loss, the bone was lost on the road somewhere, as is a usual story. Watch the neck of femur, which is also associated here. It's a vertical fracture. And the segment was contaminated with oil and grease and whatnot. At that point in time, which was 2005, as is obvious on the date uh, described there, I decided to uh, probably do a uh, three cancellous cannulated screws uh, for the neck femur and a retrograde nail there. Uh, this was the first generation retrograde nail. I compared with the other side and I maintained the length of the femur and that was the gap which was persisted. I decided to, uh, of course, there are a couple of things in mind, whether I should do a segmental transport on nail or I should do grafting, various kinds of grafting. 
um, and I really thank Adele uh, who has uh, you know taken us through the workup which we need to do in delayed cases as well as failed cases as well as revision cases in terms of uh, looking at the infection, looking at the other parameters. Of course, once everything is ruled out, then I decided to do multiple cancellous bone grafting. And uh, here I use lots of fibula strut graft. Fibula is very popular uh, in India to be used uh, to fill the gaps. So this is what I use there. And of course, iliac crest grafts also. And it was healing. When the process of healing was still going on, the guy had another fall at home. And as some of uh, you, my colleagues, must have predicted, I had put in a probably shorter nail at that point in time. So as expected, the guy had this fracture. Now, message number one, make sure that your nail is of appropriate size primarily to avoid this revision. So our first concern is to why have revisions to begin with? If you do primarily and keep some concepts of trauma in mind using adequate size, longest possible nail, you can probably avoid this. So then the, the goal was simple, remove one of the screws, put in adequate size of nail and it will heal into uh, position as desired the strut graft, the cortical cancerous grafts helped me, the neck femur healed as was desired and I was bailed out. Fracture neck of femur and shaft of femur. What's the consensus? So we think that because neck of femur is an important fracture, that should be given priority. So independent fixation is probably the way to go. This patient who came back to me with failure of plate there, one of the fractures, it is said and suggested in literature, if it's a fracture of neck of femur and sharp femur together, one of them will show you some complication. Here, it was the sharp femur with failure of plate, with failure of uh, uh, union. So, multiple options. Can I remove the nail? Can I remove the plate? Put in a retrograde nail? What does the literature say for ipsilateral neck and shaft? So I looked at the literature, neck and shaft fever, poor quality x-ray. Forgive me for that. But that was an article which I wrote long time back, published it, which wherein I used a single reconstruction nail, gamma nail in this case, with good results. That's eight years post-op. And we published this. So a single good reconstruction nail in most of the ipsilateral neck and shaft has given a good result because in uh, most of the situations, to tell you the numerical figure, 80% of the situations, the neck of femur is a missed neck of femur. It's a low velocity trauma, not displaced. Single implant will be useful. But the concept which was evolving there was to have independent fixation if it's a high velocity trauma. I still uh, was following the same uh, method of using independent fixation. I went down at the non-union side, replaced the plate with a longer plate without avoiding the biology, put in an intramedullary strut graft in the cavity, which was the ballooning on the medial side filled that with cortical cancellous grafts and voila. It was one month, three months, five months, one year. Everything healed as I wanted. So strut graft intramedullary fixation with a extramedullary surface implant, which is plate and some addition of biology in terms of grafting will bail you out in most of the revision cases. I am repeating, strut graft here acted as intramedullary nail, surface implant preserving the biology, using the working length, putting in the biology, which is the medial ballooning, adding cortical cancellous graft, build us out. Next case, again a similar neck of femur, vertical fracture, segmental loss, femur, independent fixation this time, 
I attended the neck femur first, put in that horizontal Powell screw as the first screw. Once adequate compression is achieved by that horizontal Powell screw for that vertical gardens type three fracture neck of femur, then you can put in a retrograde nail respecting the length that you want to achieve. This time the lesson learned was to put as long as nail as possible and that six months down the line, two years with good union at both neck as well as the uh, shaft femur, which can also be lower third femur. So that's the union, the good quality union. And this nail now, what we have for distal femur is third generation nail where you can put multi-directional, multi-angular, multi-planar distal screws for uh, doing a good distal femur purchase. Message here also is how do we put the Powell's horizontal screw, whether it should be configuration B or configuration C. C configuration with a lower Powell screw. Having a bicortical purchase is the best because <coughs> the unicortical fashion will have lowest resistance. So it should be configuration C. Next case, young guy. That's how the fracture was. He was operated somewhere else. I'm talking of 2014. That's how it was operated. And this has been a story for most of us. We want to see a terrific x-ray. <coughs> we want to pin down all the combinated fragments. Locking plate, great weapon was in our hands. We extended our biology devastation to such an extent that we forgot that we are denuding most of these comminuted fragments. The result, for a long time, you don't see anything happening. For a long time, we think that this painless clinical scenario, which continues, is satisfactory. So that's four and a half months, painless. And then suddenly, five and a half months, when the patient started walking, everything started giving way. That's how patient came to me with an established non-union and a broken implant. What's to happen? Biology was completely devastated. What did I do? I was adventurous that time, I must say. I removed this. I removed everything. I made sure that while removing the implants, I do not geopardize. I do not denote the fragments more than they already were. It was a young patient, extremely good quality bone, no infection, was proven. I used a longer plate, distal purchase, good proximal purchase. So I decided not to put the third screw. I was almost there. I could have. I decided not to do it. My mistake. Fibular strut graft medially, lot of cancellous cortico cancels graft from iliac crest medially. What I have achieved here again is an intramedullary fixation by virtue of fibular strut graft, adding biology on the medial side, a huge working length, young bone, that's the broken implant, and that's 16 months with excellent bone union. What did I do here? As I suggested, intramedullary fixation as well as extramedullary surface fixation and absolute stability. Absolute stability, which is what in non union we want. A biological stability, a biological solution, which in non union we want. And that's the absolute stability, which is the concept which should be followed for difficult trauma cases primarily wherein you want to avoid revisions because we know that some of these cases are going to land up with revisions if not handled properly on day one, which is intramedullary as well as surface fixation. Let's see how. So that's my uh, good friend Sunil Kulkarni's method 
of attacking such a devastated distal femurs. What I like about Sunil's uh, approach is he also takes CT scan. What does CT scan do? It will tell you how bad combination is, how bad the medial surface is. Because if it is beyond 5 centimeters of defect in any of the rotational plane medially, you need some medial support. His uh, preferred method of medial support is a rush rod. If rush rod is adequate, do you need stronger support than rush rod is another story, but that's what he prefers. Message here is in difficult distal femur cases, do not forget to do CT scan. Do not forget to measure the medial defect wherein there is no bone to bone contact. If it is beyond five centimeters, supplement primarily with some medial uh, support of your choice and avoid virus collapse, virus failure, breakage of uh, your plate in distal femur. So, some people prefer plating medially. Here is another osteoporotic uh, uh, fracture, supracondylar in a already operated total knee replacement, only supporting laterally, neglecting medial comminution, neglecting on CT, if you would have done in some plane of the CT, you would have definitely caught that loss of 5 centimeters. Now, that gap cannot be seen plane on AP or lateral. It has to be a CT, wherein on some of the views, you can detect that. Otherwise, locking plate, though a terrific implant, is amenable to fail. And what we need is a plate and nail combination to bail you out of this situation because nail here will substitute for your medial reconstruction. If you are uh, skeptical about putting a plate there or putting a Steenman pin or a rush rod there, nail is a terrific option to be used. So intramedullary will give you that axial length, axial support and plate will give you the support which is required for holding on the side. So rotational as well as axial control is obtained in this revision situation here with terrific union which you can attain. So consensus for most of these difficult distal femur or revision distal femur cases is modern retrograde nailing is a great option because it will give you an ability to go as far as lesser trochanter with maintenance of uh, anti-curvature of femur, which is there in most of these osteoporotic females. It will also give you an ability to lock distally, either using multi-angular, multi-directional screws, or there are some implants which give you a plate through which you can target the interlocking screws. The plate gives you the ability to have a surface contact on the lateral femur. So if there is a comminution on the lateral side, the screws will not walk through because that's the fear in our mind. Plating, if you want to do, respect biology, respect the working length and wherever required, do a CT scan to measure that medial defect so that you can decide on primarily doing and supporting medially your choice whether you want to put a cage there, you want to put a plate there, you want to put in a rush rod, is your choice of doing it. I suggest nailing and plating together. Of course, in revision cases, will give you success. But if you feel that it's a difficult primary, difficult medial bone, difficult area to tackle, nailing and plating done primarily in these revision uh, difficult cases, also will keep you out of this revision in distal femur, especially in osteoporotic or periprosthetic fractures. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Babalkar. Uh, unfortunately, we have uh, 3.5 uh, minutes for the questions. 
you have uh, you showed very complicated cases. Uh, I want to ask the first question: What is your general feeling about bridge plating in cases with bone loss? Uh, bridge plating, I like. Uh, in cases of bone loss, I don't do only one uh, bridge plating. I do one bridge plate and I use one more plate uh, perpendicular to it, which is 90 degrees and more so that you control. Uh, so it acts as a multiplanar. So for multiplanar fixation or a biplanar fixation, it has to be 90 degrees or more. Uh, I love the technique of bridge plating, but since uh, the concept of nailing and plating has come, what I do is I put in a uh, intramedullary nail and I put a, either a wave plate uh, or a bridge plate uh, together. So not only bridge plating as a single weapon. Okay, so maybe this or nail and plate. Okay, maybe this question is also related with the previous one. Um, uh, the question is like that: studies show struct uh, graft in femoral shafts. Uh, aren't uh, an independent positive factor for union. What is your experience? I didn't actually get the question. Uh, I think he is trying to ask that fibular strut graft are not as effective in femur. Fibular yes, shaft. I think he means like that. Okay, I think uh, we agree to disagree here because fibular strut graft is a, a dependable, good, biomechanically strong bone. Uh, which can give you or bail you out in some difficult structural long defects wherein uh, you want to, uh, you know, use biomechanically stronger graft than uh, biomechanically so-called weaker grafts in corticocancellous both. So I will leave it to the surgeon, his choice of uh, using whatever uh, method of grafting he wants to use. Okay, and the last question, uh, uh, the listener, the audience asked that uh, in the first case, uh, you made a revision for a retrograde nail. Why didn't you uh, change uh, the retrograde nail in your case? It, it appears that you just further inserted the original lathe. Is it like it or you? No, no, no. I revised it to a longer length nail, of course. Of because course. the older nail was too short. I realized it later. Mm -hmm. uh, why did yeah. I not do it uh, on day one? That's the mistake. That's why I uh, confessed that. Uh, and that's the lesson we should learn. And that's why I put the case up that when you face such a situation of fracture neck of femur and shaft femur, go as long as possible to avoid such a complication. So that's the, uh, that was the case. And if you have to revise uh, the nail for it, uh, distal femoral non-union. Uh, uh, what is the diameter of the exchange nail? One millimeter uh, larger or two millimeter One larger? or two millimeter larger. It has to be larger for sure. One mm -hmm. or two millimeter as long as you can go and uh, ream and put in the nail. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sure, sure. Thank you. So it's the time to invite my good friend Hakan Kenek would be speaking on revision surgery in tibial flexor fracture. Over to you, Hakan, now. Thank you. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, very much. Okay. Uh, before starting my talk, uh, I want to congratulate my dear friends, Dr. Jamal Ashraf and Dr. Maris Pepris for their great efforts uh, for those educational activities uh, of APTS. Uh, as they are articular fractures, the main aims in revision surgery of plateau fractures are anatomical articular reduction, if possible, restoration of length, alignment, and rotation, bone healing, and full range of motion. But on the other end, uh, since these are revision cases, most of the time we have compromised soft tissue envelope, previous scars, broken uh, implants, associated osteoporosis, stiffness of the knee, plus and minus infection. 
So I want to share some cases, uh, some revision cases on different scenarios. Maybe that will uh, help to our colleagues in their future orthopedic practice. Uh, the first uh, case example is a 62 years old male injured in a motor vehicle accident by direct crush. He had a gustilla type 1 open fracture and the neurovascular status is intact. As you can see from the direct radiograms, actually it was a comminuted proximal tibial fracture extending into the joint. And in the right-hand side CT cuts, uh, you can see the most of the combination is in the central part of the plateau between the lateral and medial plateaus. And this is the soft tissue status of the patient. After uh, close reduction under fluoroscopic control of the joint surface, I uh, uh, make a MIPO-type fixation with a laterally-based uh, lock plate. This is immediately after uh, fixation. And these are immediate post-operative radiograms. In the follow-up, uh, you can see the joint surface is okay, but the proximal uh, metaphysial uh, fragment moves medially. There is medial translation. And in the later follow-up, the plate was broken. I revised the laterally locked plate and add an, uh, also an anterior medial additional plate. And these are the radiograms three months after revision showing a union of the fracture. The second example is a malunion case. Uh, she was 68 years old female with a medial tibial plateau fracture treated conservatively. The fracture was four months old when she came to us. You can see the uh, severe varus deformity of the left uh, knee. This is the lateral radiogram. By an anteromedial incision, I uh, make an osteotomy of the malunited fracture and make a reduction and fix with this plate. And uh, after the revision, you can see it is healed in good alignment, but there is still some joint widening that I can't get uh, rid of. And these are uh, the range of motion. She has an excellent range of motion of the knee. The third example uh, is a 54 years old male, also injured uh, in a motor vehicle accident. In another uh, center, he was treated first by a joint spanning external fixator because of the soft tissue swelling and risk of uh, compartment syndrome. But unfortunately, he was admitted to our clinic four weeks later uh, after the uh, initial trauma. And as you can see, the proximal anterior pins were inserted through the quadriceps muscle and also the distal pins are very close to the fracture site. And on the radiograms, uh, you see the proximal pin configuration very close to each other. And unfortunately, he had infection on the pin sites in uh, these distal pins, very close to the fracture. In AP plane, you can see the widening of the joint and in the lateral plane, you see the step of, uh, of the uh, plateau. These are the CT cuts of the patient. You can see there was a very comminuted fracture. You see the posterior medial uh, depression. I first uh, want to reduce the anterior medial main fragment like that by help of clamps. Uh, I use uh, most of the time osteotomes for releasing the fracture ends because of the fibrous uh, union. I put some leg screws and from distally to proximally, I restore the medial uh, shaft uh, part. And as you can see, the posterior medial fragment is uh, very well depressed. And by extending the incision to the posterior medial side, I osteotomize the posterior medial fragment like that and elevate it and reduce it. You see the restoration of the joint surface and put some leg screws and then turn back to the lateral side. 
I narrowed down uh, the joints by the help of this big clamp, put some leg screws. And because of the fear of the uh, pin tract infections, uh, I want to use a, a neutralizing external fixator frame. And this is immediately after the operation. These are the follow-up radiograms. This is the clinical picture during follow-up. These are after frame removal. And this is 18 months post removal of the frame. The alignment is good, the fracture united, and these are the clinical pictures. The fourth uh, case is a 45 years old uh, female with non-union and shortening. Uh, she had a type 5 Schatzker type 5 uh, tibia plateau fracture treated uh, in another clinic. This is 2.5 years follow-up uh, she uh, brought uh, to me. You can see the uh, broken medial plate and loosened lateral screws and on the right hand side lateral radiogram you see the posterior slope is very bad and when she admitted to our clinic at post-operative four years you see the lateral screws someone some of them are broken some of them are loosened and during weight bearing you see the various deformity increases and she had also a five centimeters uh, limb length discrepancy. You can see the CT cuts. She had a very high and oblique plane non-union. And this is examination under fluoroscopy. You see there is gross motion and a very high non-union site. And these are the previous uh, surgery scars. I decided to remove the reject, the dead and avascular bone. These are during uh, resection. As you can see, I made a step cut uh, resection. The patellar tendon and uh, tibial tuberosity is in the distal part. And this is the fibular osteotomy for shortening. And after compression with the help of these clamps, I put some temporary key wires and put some circular external fixator. We have very limited uh, bone in the proximal part. And these are the immediate post-operative uh, clinical pictures. And after the first post-operative day, uh, as you can see, she could uh, weight bear in her affected extremity. Uh, in the immediate post-operative radiograms, uh, you see there is a distal percutaneous osteotomy site for lengthening. But on the lateral radiogram, I realized that I couldn't uh, effectively restore the sagittal plane alignment of the joint surface, the posterior slope. So I decided to revise my revision case. I put a, a shan screw uh, in the sagittal plane for the proximal fragment and add some hinges uh, for compression from the anterior side to uh, increase the tibial slope. This is uh, on the left-hand side before correction and on the right-hand side after correction. These uh, lines are parallel to each other, so I achieve only that much correction, about 20 degrees correction of the posterior slope. It is not perfect, but it is better uh, after than before, I think. And I lengthened the bone eight centimeters for the shortening. And this is after frame removal. The uh, fracture has healed. There is no shortening and the alignment is good. This is before and after and the ankle motion and the knee motion are like that. And the last case is a very complicated one. He had infection, soft tissue defect, non-union and limb length discrepancy. He uh, was a 53 years old male with type five uh, fracture treated elsewhere with gustilla type two open fracture. These are the initial radiograms. Uh, unfortunately, he had treated with double plating without reduction 
unfortunately. So when he came to us, 2.5 months uh, post-operative, in the right-hand side, you can see he has an active draining sinus very close to the tubule tuberosity. And on the culture, we have Staphylococcus aureus and Acetinobacter baumani, unfortunately. These are the angiogram studies, and these are the CT cuts. This is the draining sinus. I remove uh, the sinus. Uh, down uh, below, you can see the dead bone. And even the plates are inside, uh, there is motion like that. I remove the plates, and after implant removal, you can see the gross motion in the non-union side. I reject the dead and infected bone. And as you can see, this time after resection, the tibia, to, uh, tibial tuberosity and patellar tendon are connected to the proximal part. And I remove all the allograft that was placed in the previous surgery like that. I uh, debride the whole canal and irrigate the canal and put some antibiotic cement beads in the medullary canal. I made compression by the help of these clamps. You see the alignment is good, both in planes. And this is temporary fixation. And by help of my uh, colleague, this is a medial gastroc flap. We placed it under the soft tissue defect and closure of the medial wound. And I placed a circular fixator. And as you can see, I compressed the non-union site. And this is immediately after. And we, uh, we put WAC dressing for the future skin grafting over the flap. Uh, as you can see, there is a percutaneous distal osteotomy site for lengthening. And this is during lengthening. As you can see, the soft tissues are very good. The skin graft healed very well. There are no signs of infection. And this is after plate removal. Infection is gone. There is no shortening. Alignment is good and the fracture united. So in tibia plateau uh, fracture revision surgeries, what is our surgical strategy? In implant failures or non-unions, we need revision fixation plus or minus bone grafting. In malunion cases, we had to do osteotomy, restore joint reduction, length, alignment, and rotation of the lower e extremity. In infected non-unions, implant removal, debridement, irrigation, antibiotic cement beads, and external fixation are mandatory. And in post-traumatic arthritis, we need total knee arthroplasty. There are two uh, main game changer uh, literature about this topic uh, came from these uh, doctors, Dr. Rena Marty and Dr. David Telford, that could uh, help our colleagues. Uh, Dr. Rena Marty had a whole book chapter about the uh, tibial malunions. And this is uh, the article from Dr. David Halfett. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hakan. Uh, we have a few of the questions for We're you. We're running a bit late, so just two questions, then, boss. Yeah, sure. So this question is for your third case, where you have used interfragmentary screw to fix the posterior medial fragment. So the question is, is it per, uh, permissible because our seniors always insist that we put a neutralization plate rather than putting an interfragmentary screw? So what's your take, Hakan, on this? Of course, it is, uh, it is contraindicated in AO thinking. I, uh, I agree uh, with these uh, authors. But uh, as I said, uh, I opened everywhere and I could easily put the plates. But in the fear of, uh, since I made some osteotomies going inside the joint and he had pinterect infections, by fear of uh, uh, putting the microbes into the joint uh, for the risk of uh, septic arthritis, I use an external fixator. 
but uh, they are completely right. Uh, uh, all of them should be uh, buttressed with the plates. But in infected uh, site, maybe uh, alignment is alignment and get rid of infection is much more important. Okay. So the next one is from uh, David Chun. There was once great enthusiasm for hybrid fixation with internal and external fixation combined. So what are your thoughts over this hybrid fixation? Uh, most of the time, if uh, external fixation is indicated, I use uh, circular frames. And uh, this is the only patient that I opened all the joints and make osteotomies and put leg screws, then external fixator. Most of the time, if it is very comminuted or infected, I uh, use external fixation and restore the alignment rotation and uh, anatomical reduction of the joint is very difficult in cases that I use external fixator. If it is uh, easy and there is no infection risk, I go immediately uh, to internal fixation as the, uh, the AO principles. Okay, so you still use uh, a lot of internal fixation and yes. you size it with the external fixator like you had shown. So still No, no, no. I don't use uh, a neutralizing external fixator. Uh, in 95% uh, cases, I use uh, uh, the classical way, uh, the plates plate fixation in tibial plateau fractures. It is the maybe uh, the one and only <laughs> case uh, that I use uh, leg screws plus uh, external fixator. Okay, so thank you. I think uh, we're short of time. So Akan, can you take it uh, further? Okay, okay. Uh, then uh, we will uh, move on uh, to the next a speaker, Dr. Uh, Jane Ward from uh, England about revision surgery in trauma in tibia. Please, Dr. Ward. Um, hi, good morning. I just want to give a good check that everyone can hear me okay. Um, all good? Yes, Excellent. very good. Thanks, thanks, Jamal. So I say thank you so much for inviting me from the UK. It's the morning here and it's absolutely freezing. And I've been asked to talk uh, representing the British Orthopaedic Trauma Society on revision surgery in tibias. Uh, so my slide has moved on okay. Uh, so yes. can everyone see my yep. first x-ray? Yep. Perfect. Yep. So yep. Uh, this is going to be mostly case-based. And of course, we've heard earlier on how important the soft tissues are. And as we move further down the tibia, our options for reconstruction are somewhat limited by the soft tissues. And although we're talking about revision surgery, most of the time we're actually talking about salvage and trying to keep limbs on. So our first case, completely different end of the spectrum to some of the, the cases we've heard earlier on this morning, is what we deal a lot with in the UK are the osteoporotic fractures. So we've got a 93-year-old gentleman. He's pretty fitting good, actually. He likes his gardening and he walks independently. And above this tibia, he's got a well-functioning total knee replacement. So this fracture is open. Work really closely with the plastic surgeons, and we're definitely not adverse to doing free flaps in the elderly. He's worked at for a free flap and he has a, a CT angio, but there is no soft tissue reconstruction. So one thing that we do a lot of now is, I think I talked about this before, is this tibio tailor nail. And it's absolutely super for the elderly. Get up and weight bearing protects the soft tissues. But of course, the problem is we can't do it with him because he's got that pesky total knee replacement at, above. So I thought, well, a safe option would be to uh, apply a frame. And actually, frames an old, an old gentleman, they do very well. And he's up and he's walking, he's back to his gar gardening. I'm very happy. It looks as if he's united. But, but so often, uh, when we take it off in theatre, it, has, it hasn't quite got there. He goes into plaster, but unfortunately, his deformity now worsens in his plaster. And he's really now got a leg that he, he can't wait bear on and is no use to him whatsoever. So the question is, what do I do now? I can't do the tibio tailor nail because of the total knee replacement above. So you may well be thinking that um, a hind foot nail would be a really good option. But we've had some massive problems with hind foot nails for trauma. We can't forget the hind foot nails are originally designed for elective ankle arthrodesis. And certainly with trauma, the nail we've got has got a lot of valgus on. We see some uh, iatrogenic fractures. 
they loosen. They've got those two screws in the calcaneum. They notoriously back out and compromise the soft tissues. And with the hind foot nails, our, there is a limit on diameter and the length of the nail. So hind foot nails for this fracture, they're probably not long enough and have really fallen out of fashion. So what have we done? Well, we've got this new solution. We've taken down the fibrous non-union, that medial tibial bone I've excised because it's compromising your soft tissues. I've performed a fibular osteotomy and I've inserted a, a retrograde femoral nail. And this to me now has massive advantages over a hind foot nail. It's a straight nail, so it's really good for trauma. You've got a different choice of length and diameters. With all patients and the elderly, we need to get them weight bearing straight away. There's no doubt that patients prefer it to a frame. And we've heard earlier on about some problems with frames on, on the femur. But the best thing about doing this is the fixation in the talus. It's much stronger than your hind foot nail with the screws in the calcaneum. And even as we get older, the talus has got really good bone. So I like to put a spiral blade into the talus. We can lock that with the end cap and create a fixed angle, oh, angle, increasing the stability. And we can also spare the subtalar joint, just like if we were doing anterograde tibia going from the top. Um, so this is a, a similar case. Uh, this is what I did uh, before I arrived here last week. She's 78. She's a little bit younger, but she's severely demented and probably on, on a secondary due to alcohol. And again, she's got an open fracture with no soft tissue option or coverage available. Her original procedure is she's taken to theatre, have a debridement, an external fixator put on. And you can see that the overall position of her ankle at this stage is good. We can't put any metal work on the medial side because, again, there's no soft tissue option. So the surgeon elects to do profibular tibia screws, hoping that these increased screws across three cortices are going to increase the stability of the construct. But she's demented, she drinks a lot, and immediately on day one, she's up on walking. She progresses and walks and walks until they have a look at the wound. It's catastrophically broken down on the medial side. It's floridly infected and she's septic. And obviously, the x-rays show that she's got an increased tailor shift with deformity of the ankle. So what do we do now? So I do something very similar. This time, I do fuse the joint formally, though. Her medial malleolus is infected and it's been ex uh, exposed. So I'm going to debride all the dead infected bone. I'm going to get uh, take off the top of the tailor so I can increase the construct and insert again our retrograde femoral nail. Unfortunately, her talus was just a wee bit too small for our spiral blade. So we can see that we've got a boot fix just with a screw into the talus and again, lot with an end cap. Uh, she's grown at Entrococcus now in all her samples. So I think retrospectively, I, I should have taken one of your advice and put some cement around my nail with local antibiotics. We'll move on to a, another case. Um, this is a 20-year-old gentleman and he's a jockey by profession. He had a closed distal tibial fracture, and you can just see that he's uh, got the, the remnants of his fracture here on his x-rays. It's united now, but he's really unhappy. He can't ride, and he's always been unhappy uh, with his rotation. So just a, a note here now to all the people seeing post-op tibial nails. It's very, very hard with freehand nailing to check your rotation. So if you ever see a patient in the clinic early on and they say, look, doc, I'm really unhappy. My leg looks a bit twisted. Don't bury your head in the sand. Just put your hand up and say, oh, don't worry. We can correct that because correcting rotation at two weeks is so easy. Your distal screws come out, you untwist the tibia and then you can relock it. Sadly, this doesn't done to this chap and he goes on to full union, but he still can't get back to riding as a jockey. And as I say, that's his profession. Uh, this was just his original fracture. And again, to demonstrate how hard it is to get rotation with these distal tibial fractures. So we thought, oh, I know, we'll, we'll do something fairly clever. And, I, and I've probably regretted it ever since, to be honest. And so we decided to do a proximal derotational osteotomy and do it frame assisted. So he has a, a jiggly saw osteotomy, a tibial nail goes in and a fine wire fixator applied but we're not lock, not, we haven't locked the nail distally. He runs himself, I think about in total, seven corrections of his frame so that he can get his rotation absolutely how he wants it. He probably needs more internal rotation than most, I say, to do what he needs to do. 
when he's happy, we take him back to theatre, take lock his nail and take his frame off. We're happy, he's happy, all is well. Of course, that's not the end of the story. There's no point presenting cases that have necessarily gone well. And looking back at this case now, and certainly if this was a fracture, I'm sure you're all looking and thinking, what was I thinking by just having those two screws above? And you'd be exactly right, because an osteotomy really is no different to a fracture. And those two screws, when your nails in your metaphyseal diaphyseal junction, don't give you enough stability. And he goes on from our osteotomy to have an iatrogenic non-union. There was a relatively simple fixation or revision to this, and that's by percutaneous uh, insertion of the strain reduction screws, affectionately called Bob Screws in the UK, named after Bob Handley, ex-president of the BOA. And he, go, he goes on to union. But really, this was... Those two screws do not have stability. You probably, and you should treat your osteotomy. Akan, are you able to hear? Because I think there's some issues with that. No, there's, I think the connection was lost. Yeah, Jane, we can't hear you. Okay, what about now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, so I was just going to say, going back to that case, um, even with an osteotomy, that was not good enough fixation to get that to heal. If we take this fracture here, you'd have thought this had a much higher chance of going on to a non-union, but because we treated this as a fracture and we've gone for a nail and plate construct, this is healed a lot quicker than our, uh, I say, our osteotomy did. And uh, bringing back to what Shushrit said, we are definitely moving for our primary fixation as a nail and plate construct in those fractures we think have got a, a high chance of failing with a single implant. So this is my last case. I was delighted to be referred this lady who was nailed elsewhere and on her immediate post-op x-ray, they've realized that there's something not quite right with this nail. Uh, her history is this was a closed fracture. I say it was nailed elsewhere and she's a very brittle, insulin-dependent diabetic. So wherever I'm faced with vision surgery and some of uh, we've, lectures have already talked about principles, I always want to ask myself three questions. Well, first of all, I want to gather as much information as possible. And that does mean writing to other hospitals and getting other operation notes. Then from all this information, say to ourselves, look, why has this happened? And then the most important thing I think we'll all agree with with revision surgery is that we don't ever do the same thing twice. If something has failed, there's a reason for it. And we've really got to work hard and do something different. And um, so this is me gathering information from the other hospital. And I'm very grateful that they've managed to save all their IIs. So there's quite a lot of things I just want to talk about on this x-ray to try and stop the nail getting to this place in the first point. The first thing we know with nailing, the most important thing is the entry point. This entry point is too anterior. When you ream, you're going to ream out the anterior cortex. Secondly is the imaging. The imaging is not acceptable. It's not a true lateral. And uh, we saw some beautiful x-rays of when we saw the femoral condyles as one. And that's what we need to aim for, not this x-ray. The positioning is wrong in this. Even for a super patella nail, the leg is too extended. And you can see the other x-ray on the II. So I haven't quite got the optimum amount of flexion. And then the last thing is they're not using the kit right. That trocar is sat way above the patella and the trocar needs to be way down. So nailing, what are the two key points? Well, it's uh, entry point and it's reduction. This fracture is not reduced. They've tried a percutaneous clamp. It hasn't worked. And then they've got the guide wire across the fracture site. We can all do that with these not enough. We need the guide wire to be in the center of the fracture on the AP and lateral and the fracture has to be reduced. The other thing is they've struggled with the proximal locking. 
you can see that that screw's been too long and they've tried to exchange that and put in a screw that's now too short. They've had to build up the nail using the end cap, suggesting that nail's a little bit too far in and our proximal locking is not in the optimal position. So we've gathered all the information and now we need to do the thinking. So why has this happened? Well, it's not been reduced, so the fracture is shortened. The bone is osteoporotic, she's diabetic, and the screws have cut out. She's had a poor entry point leading to her degree of varus. So we've gathered information, we've done the thinking, and now we have to do something different. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, super patella nails. I'm not sure if the rest of the sort of speakers are, but even this nail, I couldn't take out from a super patella point of view. So if a nail is going to have to be taken out or you think it might have to be taken out because you're going to go onto a non-union or an open fracture, my preference is to put it in from an infrapatella point of view because that's how it's going to have to be removed. And obviously, we're going to be doing infrapatella nails if you've got a floating knee so that you can perform a retrograde nail through the same incision. Uh, so I've removed it from an infrapatella point of view, and it was relatively easy to exchange. Um, as what you guys have said, I've put in a nail that's bigger, at least one size more. I've gone for multiple locking screws into the proximal fragment. I've used cancellous bone locking screws, and I've tried to use angular stable locking screws to give it a bit more stability. So, yeah, so when we're revising, do gather as much information as possible, make a plan, try and work out why this has uh, failed. Is it mechanics? Is it biology? Is it infection? Is it a combination of all things? And every uh, reason needs a different strategy to deal with it. And when you're revising your fixation, don't repeat the same operation twice. But the most important thing is to stop revision surgery in the first place. And there's a big push in the UK, uh, both electively and now in trauma, is to do one operation. And GERFT, if you're not familiar, of saw stands for getting it right first time. Uh, this was uh, a patient who got fixed at another country and her surgeon told her that he was the world expert on putting in tibial nails. However, I, I somewhat beg to differ. Anyway, thank you very much. And I'm sorry about my Wi-Fi. Thank you, Dr. Ward. And unfortunately, we have uh, some uh, more minutes. Maybe we can, uh, I can ask you two questions. Uh, there is a question about the post-operative protocol in tibiotelar nails uh, with putting only one screw to the talus or a spiral blade. When, we, uh, when will you allow weight bearing in these uh, patients? Dr. Ward? I think Jane's having some trouble, trouble with her internet okay. connection. So if we're not able to get her, I think uh, maybe if we have time in the end, so okay. Dr. you can invite Cheryl to make his presentation. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Anup, you have unmuted. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, please go ahead. And my, and my slides are uh, full screen, yeah? Yeah. All right, excellent. Okay, so as the last uh, lecture of this series, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the uh, Asia Pacific Trauma Society for inviting me uh, as part of the uh, academic initiative with the uh, Asia Pacific Orthopedic Association. Um, the last lecture will be the, 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 the furthest away from, from, from the first one, which is the uh, distal tibial fractures, which, which Jane has covered quite a bit. So I will cover a bit more on it when it, when it comes to, to these sort of injuries. Okay, so the outline is I'm going to discuss three cases which, which uh, I've seen uh, over my career, which, which, have, uh, which uh, has been pretty difficult. These are different scenarios, I would say, uh, different treatment options, and also requires a, probably a different mindset for, for each of these, these, sort of, these sort of cases. So let's start off with this 38-year-old with this, uh, lady who is a PhD student who on one of her holidays uh, went back to her hometown and, and fell off a, a tree while harvesting some fruits, as, as we usually do. So here we have the radiographs. As, as we can see here, uh, first of all, we can see that it's a, a varus deformity, severely intraarticular comminution. Uh, 
uh, varus fibula, and on the lateral radiograph, that line is the distal tibial axis. And and I uh, no, I I I would um, encourage everybody to actually draw this line, this distal tibial axis, and and draw it to see whether it actually goes through the sort of lateral talus station, which is here. And this is a good indication to see whether the, the talus is actually displaced anteriorly or posteriorly. So in this patient, luckily, the, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty much neutral. So it's, it, that's, that's pretty good. So we have a, a various deforming intra-articular distal tibial fracture. Uh, because she was in the rural area, so she was she was brought to to some of the hospitals with, with I would say, uh, um, and 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 this 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 was actually done. Um, in in the height of of wanting to treat, most of the time, a lot of people would put some form of uh, fixation to actually partially stabilize the articular surface. Uh, and in this in this situation, an intra uh, intramedullary nail for the fibula, a makeshift sort of external fixator with uh, with with a, a, a POP, uh, and and as we can see here again on the lateral view, we can see that now the tail is actually, is actually displaced anteriorly because the lateral tail station here is anterior to the distal tibial axis, so we we can see that. With this sort of fixation that's been done, the, the distal tibia is still in varus. The intra-articular surfaces have, have, have not been addressed and it's, and it's uh, uh, mal-reduced. Okay, so six months down the line, uh, uh, I mean, she, uh, she, was, she was treated completely in, 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 the, in, 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 her, in her hospital and they've taken out the, the, the wires. And she came to us with this uh, uh, various deforming ankle, uh, subfibular pain, uh, and a, a, a talus which was relatively preserved. Okay, uh, and this was seen by by the, the the MR. So further investigations was was basically basically to see what's actually going on in the articular surface reassess the alignment uh, and and these positions is it is it is it uniting is it not uniting uh, and so on and so forth and to see what we we can actually do so mrs were done we can actually see that this this posterior uh, malleolar piece is actually a posterior medial piece which has been uh, put into uh, into probably we can say it's it's put into extension so you can see a large gap there can see a uh, impacted uh, intra-articular uh, uh, piece, a lot of fibrous tissue, uh, and you can see there's there's beaking uh, at the anterior aspect of the articular surface. CTs were done. You can see that okay, the articular surface is is completely irregular. Uh, you can see that the 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 uh, the ankle is in varus. You can see that the fibula is in varus. It's long and impinging on the lateral side, uh, articular surface. You can see that it's uh, it's um, irregular, and the the anterior part is is uh, is actually opened up, so it, it should be slightly further down. So, in view of her age, uh, in view of the preserved uh, uh, articular surface of the of the of the talus. Uh, we decided to offer her uh, uh, intra-articular osteotomies to, to actually correct the, the 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 articular surface. Okay, so the so these were the drawings, the the simple drawings that 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 were made from the the the, the radiographs. So we can see that uh, the plan was intra-articular osteotomies. Okay, to get the articular surface corrected, recorrecting the posterior medial fragments so that we can we can correct the 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 various deformity uh, of the distal tibia, uh, reduce the impaction fractures to get the articular surface correct, reduce that sort of anterior beak so that we can we can bring it down so we can cover the the, the talus, and obviously is to to correct the 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 various deformity of the fibula. Uh, by uh, cutting out a wedge so that it can go into valgus and that, that effectively sh uh, shortens the, the, the fibula as well. 
So this is what was done. Uh, so we, we we had a standard incision on the lateral aspect for the for the fibula. We started off with that. We had a large anterior medial incision to address the articular uh, surface from anteriorly, so that we can actually uh, do the osteotomies. Uh, we had a supplementary posterior medial uh, uh, incision to uh, uh, to to help with the osteotomy of the posterior medial uh, fragments and and its reduction. Okay, so so um, an anti glide plate. This is this is an anti glide plate at the tip of the posterior medial fragment. We use one of the old uh, uh, distal tibia sort of uh, uh, pilon uh, plates with that sort of large. Uh, um, uh, I, I see it's like like arms going so that it can hug the actual actual fracture, and then we just use the a, a one third tubal plate and a uh, and a uh, interfragmentary screw for the fibula. And this is just a close-up uh, uh, view of, of the of the articular surface. Um, you know, during during those sort of times, uh, we 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 actually went back and 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 did a CT of of the of the uh, ankle just to see what what things are happening. And it looked like we did manage to reconstruct a bit. I mean, I wouldn't say it's perfect, but it it would be much better than before. And and with the ankle being very resilient to to uh, osteoarthritic changes, uh, and with the age of of thirty seven, with a preserved talus, this might last uh, uh, quite a while. So the after all the implants were removed, uh, three years af uh, after that, we can we can see that yes, she has developed. Uh, arthritic changes with, within the ankle. The anterior beak actually made it made it bigger, and you know we can see here an indication of the development of us uh, 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 arthritic changes would be that the talus is still slightly anterior to the uh, lateral talus station. So uh, she's doing pretty well. Uh, like I said, the the ankles are are, are very resilient, uh, um, but she 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 may develop symptoms in, in the future. Here's a different case. Uh, this is a, a, a difference in age. Sixty-five-year-old male. He's a he's a he's a farmer, and he fell two years prior to this. And and looking at these radiographs, so we can poss possibly predict that the the injury was an axial impaction uh, injury on the anterior aspect of the plafond. Um, he was treated uh, purely with a, a, a plaster of Paris. And then he was brought uh, uh, to us uh, by by his children because he complained that it's it's difficult to work in in the fields and it's becoming increasingly painful. So what we can see here is you know uh, there's there's um, I can show you here that the uh, talus has actually extruded anteriorly because the lateral talus station is anterior to the uh, distal tibial axis. You can see a large uh, intraarticular uh, gap. Um, and uh, I don't have the the the, the MRs here, but the, the the articular surface of the cartilage has also been eroded because of the nature of his his, his occupation. Okay, but the 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 good thing is because it's an axial sort of impaction intact sort of thing. Then there's 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 really no extra articular uh, uh, malunion. But these are some of the most severe injuries that we know in 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 performing fractures. So in discussion with him, uh, we, we, we mentioned that uh, there, there are a few things that we can possibly do. We can do uh, uh, corrective uh, osteotomies to get the alignment of, of, of the talus uh, correct, uh, the alignment of the articular surface correct. Uh, and, but if we do not do anything for the articular surface, it may lead to pain later on, bearing in mind his age. Or we can we can we can correct all of this and then and then and then resurface the 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 articular surface. Okay, so the idea was uh, initially we we did a supramalleolar malleo osteotomy. You can see the large gap there, and and this idea was was a good first step because it it gains alignment of the articular surface. It gives good bone stock because this is this is this is healed bone. Uh, and then it, get, it also, if we can actually rotate it anteriorly, then we can get anterior coverage. Uh, the the problem that we saw uh, because the talus have, has actually shifted anteriorly. So we 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 did the supramalleolar um, osteotomy. Uh, we corrected it. We 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 managed to get quite a uh, good gap there, and we supplemented it with a with a, a sort of um, a, a buttress plate. 
looking looking at this, and we know that the budget space is not going to be strong enough to 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 actually do this, even though we're we're putting in uh, uh, bone grafts, and 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 this was all done through a, a an, an anterior approach, and with the articular surface being not very good, then we 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 proceeded for for. Uh, 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 salvage resurfacing of the of the of the ankle joint so in addition to this we know that the uh, uh the bone stock is good this will take uh, uh the tibial tray of a total ankle replacement very well uh, and will resurface the the the, the uh, talus so in this sort of situation uh, uh a supra a supramalleolar osteotomy was done to uh, to correct the articular surface to gain uh, alignment and also bone stock so that it, it uh, and cover the anterior uh, uh, aspect of the of the ankle so that it gave better alignment and and placement for for a, a, a total ankle uh, arthroplasty and the last case. This is a, a different a different picture altogether. So this is this is a, a, a fresh case. This is a an open three B uh, distal tibia fracture, large amount of circumferential skin loss. Uh, you can see here that there's severe intraarticular comminution. Okay, and and it is severely comminuted. Uh, thank God that neurovascularly intact. But these are the sort of situations, uh, and I put this in where a primary uh, 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 patient feels like uh, you're actually doing a revision because of the nature of the, of, of the, of the case itself. Um, he has a sensate foot. Uh, so these are, these are things going, going for, for, uh, for, for this patient. So the, the, the main ideas for, uh, going back to principles that we've mentioned throughout this, 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 this couple of hours is uh, soft tissue resuscitation, uh, prevention of infection, a uh, debridement of contaminated bone and wounds, and then uh, uh, soft tissue and bony stabilization. And in this case, because bone is lost, skin is lost, and this is this was done by shortening. So you can see here that the the whole articular surface has been debrided, and there's there's really nothing left. Okay, so that external fixator, uh, the, the normal external fixator was was converted to a, to a, a fine wire circular, uh, circular frame, uh, knowing that there's, there's going to be some secondary work that's going to be done uh, and, the, and the duration of, of the, uh, the length of uh, time that these, these, these frames are going to be on. Uh, so a hydrophilic sort of matrix cover for the skin was done uh, 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 repeated, repeated sort of uh, uh, soft tissue uh, dressings and, and 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 coverages. So over a period of time, this this actually this actually healed, and, and we managed to to actually uh, control uh, the the infection. But in these sort of situations, you know, we've we've got bone loss. So at at that particular moment in time, we know that we've we've had a, 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 a acute shortening. So. It, Similar principles to all the other cases that that, that we've seen. Uh, once we have the circular frame on, then this allows us to actually transport uh, bone, which is good, which is further away from the potential areas of of, of infection. So that was transported over, over a period of nine months, uh, supplemented again with a with a with a nail, and distally in in these sort of situations, we use a a, a tibial talo calcaneal uh, fusion to, to to the ankle uh, to, uh, and to, to get good union. Okay, so in summary, um, it's, it's very important when we're looking at these sort of revision sort of cases, either primary or secondary sort of revisions to select and understand your patient very well. Uh, in the distal tibia, we need to remember that they, these are intra-articular and also extra-articular revisions that can be done or, or as a combination of both. And, and we need to remember when it comes to revision, uh, re revision of the articular surface can also be salvaged. So, so we also have the options of, of uh, replacement of the, of the uh, articular cartilage. And hopefully in the future, then there, there, there'll be more things like uh, biologics where we can, we can actually have uh, uh, transplanted articular surfaces and so on and so forth. And always remember that severe primary cases uh, may need to be treated like revisions as well. Thank you very much. That's it for me. Thank you, Carol. Uh, you have really shown very difficult cases. Uh, we have a few questions for you. One sure. of the questions is, in such severe combination, should we not attempt ankle fusion instead of doing such extensive surgeries? 
it 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 really depends because uh num- number one yes uh ankle fusion is always an option yeah uh so it it depends we we need to discuss these sort of things with 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 with, with patients uh we can say that yes uh, most patients uh uh, uh Uh, cope very well with with ankle fusions, but in 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 our Eastern society, uh, they they really pre- they really want their their ankles yeah, yeah, in terms of uh, methods of sitting down, how they how they uh, function in the kitchen, how they function in, in in the fields, and and how they how they pray, and this requires a, a lot of the, the the sort of movement of the ankle. So I think. Uh, um, Uh, a lot of counseling with the patient is 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 important before before doing that but it is yes it is an option so patient should ideally be given both the choices and absolutely surgery they may require and then pros and cons then a decision should be taken absolutely correct yeah so there's another question till what age do you recommend multiple corrective osteotomies for revision surgery in ankle should be <coughs> attempt in an elderly or not yeah um it it it, it, it yeah it, it it depends uh number one um the the ankle the ankle is very resilient so so no, uh, number one if even if we have articular uh uh erosions in 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 the ankle sometimes it, it it looks like that on on plain radiographs but it becomes only symptomatic usually on average about 7 to 8 years later so that's 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 one thing that that that, that we can we can we can see um the 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 example that i showed of a total ankle replacement is 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 another is another thing because the 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 longevity of ankle replacements at this moment in time is 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 um you know it's anywhere between 10 to 15 years so it's not as developed as knees and and hips so when we when we're searching for patients who 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 need replacements they they are of the 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 elderly generation but i would say that if if uh there's so many factors number one cost number two rehabilitation number three the 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 exposure and the the ability to actually do uh the sort of intra uh, articular osteotomies and the and the fixation and to prevent any potential complications these are the things that need to be weighed and do you really use ct scan every time 3d ct before planning for all these multiple osteotomies or you just do it on the basis of x rays only No, no. I, 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 I'll always do CT scans. Okay. I think that's all. Uh, yeah. Uh, although, although we've just come to the end of it, but there are seven questions relating to one or two words that Jane used. So I am compelled to ask that: What's a Bob screw? Oh, good. Hopefully, Wi-Fi back on. So Bob Hanley, who's uh, I think you might know from AO, so he's just finished being the president of the BOA. he was the key author on this strain reduction theory written with a lot of other uh, trauma surgeons in the UK so okay they are percutaneous strain reduction screws but i say we cloak oh unfortunately we don't have to answer oh, there are some issues with your wifi again anyway because the questions are coming that you know the your osteotomy side that was going under non union conventionally should have had a plate been put there so are those two screws strong enough to provide what they're meant to provide yes without the soft tissue problems that plating the proximal tibia can have okay are these bob screw only for uh, fractures or osteotomies going into non union or below union or nor you are doing it primarily also along with the nail when you are doing osteotomies Yeah no great question no i haven't done any bob screws uh as a primary because i guess the theory behind them is they're reducing the strain when your fracture has gone under a hypertrophic non union but i think all the other techniques we've seen we are definitely exactly as you've said these are essentially primaries that we're treating like revisions okay thank you thank you very much i am grateful on behalf of marinus and the society for all of you for spending your time on a sunday and delivering such wonderful lectures and we hope to trouble you again soon in our future series on some other topics thank you very much once again
Have a good evening. Thank you, Gabal. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, you so everybody. much. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you so much. Bye-bye. 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 Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you. Okay, sir. We are now off air. Uh, Rohit, sir. Rohit, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, we are now off air, sir. Uh, should thank I end the meeting? Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. You can end it now. Thanks for putting it on. Yeah, okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye. Bye, sir.